Remember that. Uh, today I want to talk to you about the joy uh, of God, God's joy. See if that thing's working. We're good. If I ask you this question as we start, what do you celebrate? If you go to a wedding, you may well celebrate uh, that you find love is important. You celebrate that love's important to you. If you celebrate a birth, it's, it could well, uh, it does indicate that you have a, uh, a love for life. If you celebrate an anniversary, it celebrates your love for marriage. If you celebrate Independence Day, uh, it celebrates your love for freedom. If you celebrate the opening of Walmart store, recognizes that you have a love for a bargain. If you celebrate an A on your child's test, indicates that you have a love for learning. And if you celebrate a touchdown, it indicates that you have a love of sports and you are not cheering for the Cleveland Browns. That's what it means. <laughs> what, what do you celebrate? What do you rejoice in? Because we're talking today about God's, uh, God's joy and what God rejoices in. It's going to come from Luke 15. We'll look at most of that in paraphrase this morning, but I have one key verse we'll start with. Uh, Luke 24, verse 15, where when Jesus tells the story of the prodigal son, uh, Jesus says this, He says, This son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Uh, let's pray as we start. Father in heaven, we are, we are so thankful to be able to assemble here today. We recognize you as the maker of heaven and earth, the creator of all things. Um, we strive here to please you and bring, bring you glory. As we open the scripture today to see what brings you joy, may we, uh, may we act on what we find in the scripture. Uh, as the Bible teaches us, you want everybody, all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. So may we be your hands and feet, may we serve you, and do it with joy, because that's what Christ brings us, uh, forgiveness and hope, because your grace is sufficient. We praise and thank you today. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now when you open up your Bible and you turn to Luke chapter 15, uh, this chapter starts with this verse. Ah oh, man, I'm ahead of myself. Uh, we'll look at 15.1 just a second. This sermon today, this sermon today revolves around lost people. Um, you you got to realize the Bible says that outside of Christ you're lost. And people say, well, what are you talking about, man? I ain't lost. The Bible says outside of Christ there's no hope and there's no life. Because Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He said that in John 14, verse 6. And the disciples reiterated that in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. When they said this as they preached, Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. So Jesus is the way. Outside of Christ, there's no hope. And when you look at the mission of Jesus in Luke 19, verse 10, He said, The Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. That was Jesus' mission on earth. Now when you open up to Luke 15, you turn to uh, Luke 15, you look at verse 1. Uh, the Bible says this, it says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Now I find that interesting because uh, Jesus attracted tax collectors and sinners. Now there's a, lot of, there's a lot of sinners today who really find Christians repulsive. It's like, man, I, I don't want to go over there to all them Christian people are. And you see the difference? Jesus lived his life and, and loved people and, and He attracted sinners. But yet those of us who follow Christ, sometimes we find ourselves in a position where people who, don't, who are lost and, and uh, not in Christ, they want to stay away from us. If you think that's a problem, do your head like this right here. Uh, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, it says, whoever, uh, whoever claims to live in Christ must walk as Jesus did. So if, if non-Christians find us repulsive, that, that could well be a problem that we got to look at. As Jesus taught, he attracted even sinners. And because of that, the religious people were really offended. Verse 2 says, uh, The Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. Now that muttering comes, they're whispering and so forth. Uh, it comes out of a bitter heart. Uh, they're not happy. Uh, muttering is what losers do. And that's what the Pharisees are in this situation. Um, they're muttering... This man, he welcomes sinners and eats with them. 
Now, in response to that, Luke 15, verse 1 and Luke 15, verse 2, Jesus proceeds to tell three parables that we'll look at today in, in paraphrase form. And, and notice what the uh, conclusion of each parable, it's rejoicing and it's joy of finding something that is lost. So keep that in mind as we look. And as we go through this, you've got to remember our key verse for the year. We went to Noah's Ark a few weeks ago, had the verse on a lot of t-shirts, a lot of folks had the shirt on. Uh, said East Point Church of Christ, but above that it says Psalm 100 verse 1, which says, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. <laughs> Woo! If the Bible says it, we got to do it. it. says shout for joy, we got to shout for joy. So keep that in mind as we look. First he said, um, he, he tells a story about a shepherd. He had a hundred sheep, and one of those sheep, uh, it wandered away. Now, sheep do that, and I'm not a shepherd. Uh, I, I have been to a petting zoo. I don't know if that counts, but I'm not a shepherd. But I have read about sheep, that sheep are known for being really foolish animals. In fact, at times, one sheep will walk off of a cliff, and other sheep will just blindly follow. They just walk off the cliff. So sheep are prone, because of their nature, they're prone to wonder. And as the flock... Uh, uh, um, eats and so forth as they stay together maybe one gets distracted on something and it just wanders away and as Jesus tells this, this parable an earthly story with a heavenly meaning he says the shepherd had a hundred sheep and one wandered and he left the ninety nine and he went after the one sheep that was lost and when he found that sheep the Bible says in Luke 15 verse 6 it says he called his friends and his neighbors together and he said Rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. Notice what he didn't do. He didn't go with the rod of chastisement and beat that sheep over the head. What's the matter with you? Uh, he carried it on his shoulders and he called his friends to rejoice because what was lost has been found. Secondly, in Luke 15, Jesus tells this parable. There's a woman. She has ten coins. Um, and we find here with these ten coins, one of them was lost because of neglect. Now the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is that a sheep may well wonder. Coins are like my cell phone and my car keys. They don't wonder. But that's what I always say, who took my keys? And then my wife says what my mom used to say, I think they conspire against me, and they say, oh, where'd you have them last? <laughs> Oh, it always gets me. Uh, sheep may wonder, but a, a coin can't wonder. This woman has neglected her coins and she's, she's misplaced one. She has ten, one's missing. And as Jesus tells this parable in Luke 15, verses 8 through 10, uh, he, he shows diligence that she moves her furniture. She sweeps the floor. She does everything she can do until she finds that coin that's lost. And the Bible says there in Luke 15, verse 9, when she found it, she called her friends and her neighbors together and says, Rejoice! Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. There are some that are lost because they wonder. There are some that are lost because they're just neglected. And as we consider the idea of being lost as being outside of Christ, some people just wonder. They get distracted and they just wonder. Other people are just neglected. And how many times are people outside of Christ because those of us in the church fail to reach them with the good news? Man, think about that. As somebody uh, could be saved, but we've just neglected to share the good news with them. Do you know that um, they say, and this is from the Barna survey people, uh, they say that the estimate is 190 million, that's just their estimate, 190 million unsaved people in the United States of America. 190 million. And there's only 300, 330 million total population. So that's, that's their numbers, whether it's right or not. It's a whole different discussion. 190 million. Dude, that's a lot. Of people here in the red, white, and blue, they're outside of Christ. Now I want you to think, if I said a fire is coming, and you have to save as many people as you can, say that you can save 1,000 people a day. That's 365,000 people a year. 1,000 people every day. 365,000. If you do that for a whole year, you'll save 365,000. 
And if you do that for 521 years, every day for 521 years, you will save 190 million people. So then you quickly realize, well, dude, I, I can't do it all. And that's what I wanted to show you. You can't do it all. The, the good news is we can't do it all. Or I don't know if this is good news or bad news. Uh, the worst news is uh, a fire is actually coming. And since we can't do it all, what, what can we do? Well, here's the deal. If you and I, just two of us, just you, somebody, whoever you are, and I, me, the two of us say we're going to win somebody to Christ this year. This calendar year we're going to win one person to Christ. And if we say from now on every year we will win one person to Christ. And, and let's say that every person we win to Christ will also every year win one additional person to Christ. You know, the next year we'll have two people here. The following year we'd have four, and then we'd have eight, and then we'd have 16, and then we'd have 32, and then we'd have 64, and then we'd have 128, and then we'd have 256. Do you realize that within 40 years, if we and I, you and I, we just, we just gain one person to Christ, within 40 years we could theoretically convert one trillion people. Do you, do you realize that there are only uh, eight billion people on the planet? A trillion is 160 times the current world population. We don't, have, we don't have to win everybody. We just have to win one person. I win one person for Christ's sake. You win one person for Christ's sake. We quit neglecting people, overlooking our neighbors, our friends, the people we work with, the people we see at the Walmart store. We start sharing the good news with them. We can turn what the Bible says in Acts 17 verse 6. The disciples of Jesus turn the world upside down. We realize, see, uh, for a sheep, when he found it, he rejoiced. For a coin, when she found it, she rejoiced. Jesus tells a third parable. He says in Luke 15, it's the, it's the parable of the lost son. We see uh, lost because of wandering. Secondly, lost because of neglect. And thirdly, uh, it's lost because of rebellion. Now, in the story of the prodigal son, a man has two sons. The younger one... He said, basically, he said, Dad, I wish you were dead. He really didn't say that, but what he said was, Dad, give me my share of the inheritance. Now, he wouldn't get that until his dad died, so really what he said was, I wish you were dead. And incredibly, the father gave the younger son his portion. And as the story unfolds, as Jesus tells it, that younger son went and spent everything he had on wild living. He says, riotous living. And he found himself in the sheep uh, in the pig pen, rather, not sheep, but pigs. He found himself uh, feeding the pigs. That's, that's of so much significance because for Jewish people, pigs were unclean. They, they couldn't be around them, they couldn't touch them, and they, they were forbidden also to eat them. So it was the bottom of the barrel, literally. And when he in all of his brokenness comes to his senses, he said, I know what I'll do. I will go home. And I'll just come clean. I'll tell Dad I made a huge mistake. This is my fault. And let me please, let me be one of your hired servants. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And as Jesus tells this parable in Luke 15 verse 20, uh, the Bible says while he was still the prodigal son, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him was filled with compassion. The father ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and kissed him. Church, let me ask you a question. What makes you run? I mean, I, I run every Sunday morning because every Sunday morning we're late for church. And we're running through the house, get the shoes, and the boys are just like their daddy's car keys. Boys, where are your shoes? I don't know. Somebody took them. They broke in our house. They took our shoes again. We're running like crazy. What makes you run? Is it, is it to catch a bus or to catch the plane running through the airport at the terminal? What makes you run? Because you're late for an appointment? What makes you run? Because you want to get in shape. Well, I want to lose weight. That's why I run. When we ask the bigger question, what makes God run? And it's the idea of His children coming home. You see in direct, without any stretch of the imagination, Jesus is telling this parable. The Father is clearly, it's God. And He's looking for His children to come home. And if you're looking for the only time in the entire Bible where God is depicted as running, it's in Luke 15, verse 20. When the father sees his son, he goes running to meet him. And he's not mad. He threw his arms around him. 
He's filled with compassion. He kisses his son. And he goes on to say, he says, the father says, bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast then. Celebrate. It's time to rejoice. Why? This son of mine was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he is found. So they began to... You see, when we realize it, what? What makes God happy? I mean, as we study this book about who God is, the Bible, and it tells us His character, His nature, the Lord is good, His love endures forever. And we study who God is and we ask that question. Well, we're His, we're created in His image, and we claim to be those of us in Christ. I mean, if I remember correctly, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, If anyone is in Christ, He's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And if we are brand new, if we are really Christ, if, if we belong to Christ, if we are really, shouldn't we, don't we always have to consider what could we do to actually please God? What can we do to make the Almighty happy and joyful? And clearly, the Bible says reaching those who are lost that's what brings God joy. The Bible says, um, God, God wants, I don't know what the problem is on that slide, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, it says in 1 Timothy 2, it says this is good. The prayer for, for request that, that the church will live quiet and peaceful lives. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Ezekiel 33 verse 11 says, As surely as I live, declares the Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Do you realize? Do you realize that um, every time a Muslim extremist blows himself up, God's not happy. God doesn't want wicked people to do wicked things. God wants people, He wants he no, no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He would rather instead they turn from their wicked ways and live. Because He wants everybody to be saved. And the Bible tells us, the Lord says, Isaiah 29, which Jesus quoted over Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 8. The prophet Isaiah says, These people come near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship for me is made up only of rules taught by men. You see, what we're striving to do here at East Point, we, we're a continuation of what was really began in the 1800s of a, what's called the, the Restoration Movement. And, and it's, an, it's the idea of uh, getting away from man-made rules and, and regulations and just get back, man, what does the Bible say? And let's just do Bible things and Bible ways, we'll get Bible results. No creed but Christ, no book but the Bible. We're not going to be anything more than Christians. We're going to be Christians only. When we read uh, those who honor God with their mouths, that, that brings Him no pleasure. What He wants is our hearts. And the heart of God, the joy of God, is lost people being saved. And today I bring you the message that uh, because of what Jesus Christ did at Calvary, it's when God became a man, He was here in the flesh, the Son of God. He laid down His life. Though he never sinned, he never lied, he never lusted, he never committed any transgression at all. The Bible says he was tempted even as we are, yet he was without sin. Though he had never sinned, he laid his life down in our place. The death of Jesus was substitutionary. He bore our chastisement so we could have life, peace, meaning, purpose, heaven. Praise the Lord! And that reminds me of that verse we said once, uh, Psalm 100 verse 1 which says, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Woo! Woo! That's the good news. And, and we've been studying this year, it's impossible. What can we do to grow the church? Here's the answer, we can't. We can't grow it. What we can do is plant and water. And we can do that with joy. Nobody wants a free car if they have to push it. Christianity is not a car you have to push. It is a, uh, it's a humdinger of a ride, man, and it's free that God gives you the keys to. It's grace, and it's yours. And nobody here at East Point, we don't have to do anything, but we get to. 
We get to show up. We get to serve the Lord. We get to sing praises to His name. We get to study His Word. We get to live for His glory. Amen. Because His grace is sufficient for us. Because our sins are forgiven. Because we're going to heaven. Woo! That's the gospel truth. And that's the gospel message. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Which means good news to every creature. Uh, Jesus said there in Mark 16, verse 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who believes not will be condemned. It's a new life. It's, it's meaning, it's purpose. It's only found in Christ Jesus who's Lord of all.